We only have, after today, three more class periods and then the final. Ooh, no. okay. <laughs> three more after this. And then, those of you that are living in the present, those of you that are living where you can actually live, will... Um, We'll have a scenery change in the present. Those of you that are living for something in the future can cross one more period of your life off the list. But every time you cross something off the list and you're delighted to be over it, even if it's something painful, realize that it's gone. It's gone. And there are no come a dawning perspective in most of you if it hasn't already happened. One thing that when people that are young get some um, fatal disease or they lose somebody close to them and they say it could be me and they start thinking about mortality and that sort of thing, uh, that brings this awareness younger. But most people by the time they, they start to um, droop and sag and be all worn out and start to recognize, shoot, how long do I have? Man, I better, I better, I better make hay while the sun shines and I can see it dip and fall in the sky. So, one of the challenges of spirituality is to embrace your life in the only form and pieces it comes to you, which is now, not later, now. And to, to take joy in everything. Paul says that he, he even rejoiced in his suffering. Um, Romans uh, 8.18 is usually not the Romans 8 passage that we quote from when they're having a bad time. Usually we quote Romans 8.28. We know that all people work together for good for them. We know that one. That's, I don't actually find near the hope in verse 28 that I find in verse 18. 
And Romans 8, 18 says, um, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Whatever you have to know, it's not even worth comparing. However, it's all we have. Every moment, if we don't live in it, then our life is just added up moments that we did not live in. So then when did you live? Never lived in anything real. Um, that's my name, bring that up because Sometimes my dad will text us and be like, what time is it? Yeah. And like, if we don't respond to now, he'd be like, no. He'd say, like, no. But, is that right? Yeah. And, uh... Why is father? Yeah. And another thing is, he's always like, if you really think about it, the now is always, like, <clears throat> good, kind of. It is? Like, most of the time when you, like, sitting right here, like, everything is pretty good. Yeah. It is? We'll talk some more about that. Just a second. Hold that thought on the frame, and we're going to go right back to what you're talking about that your father says. Let's talk about that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> father, we invite your spirit again to be here to remind us that. You already were and are and are having been in Jesus' hands. Um, in fact, this is a little strange. You might be in track with this, or you might say, I don't know what he's talking about. But try, because it's, if it clicks, it'll be something that will be, you can turn into one of the most useful things you'll ever learn. In order for you, in your mind, um, as facilitated by your brain, the way that it functions, uh, the mechanical part of you, in order for you to have awareness of something, awareness and perceptions appear to come in chunks. They're chunky, they're not continuous. Like a digital clock, instead of like the clock that has a second hand like this, or like the clock on your phone that, that just keeps clicking from one minute or one second to the next, but, or even if you have a stopwatch that's in hundreds or thousands, it's not continuous. It's, um, it's chunky, even if the chunks are small. When we become aware of something, uh, the something has to last a certain amount of time or we'll never be aware of it. Did you know that? If you, if you show somebody something too fast, if it flashes before their eyes too fast, or it touches them too briefly, and then stops having any effect at all, if it's too fast, it won't even be likely to register. And if you touch somebody once, and let up, and touch somebody again, you picture this in your mind. You picture somebody behind you touching your back once, twice, three times. Okay? Then picture them doing it fast. Okay? Then imagine that it's so fast that it's like as fast as if you put a car in the spoke of a bicycle and rode really fast. <laughs> if it's too fast, it'll feel like you got touched one time. And if something only touched you one of those times that fast, they didn't harm you, or it just touched you. you. You might not even perceive that it happened. So, if you picture that this is time, 
You can picture it in seconds or minutes or years, whatever units you want. But let's pretend that we're looking at something as small as milliseconds and then as small as nanoseconds. A tiny little amount of time that you couldn't actually, you, we just don't have the capacity to time it out in our head. Um, because it, it's possible for us, and we do this electronically, we do this mechanically even, to make things that happen faster or more frequently than the scale of time that our brain mediates our awareness to us, the things that we actually can see or feel or experience in our consciousness. So let's say, though, that a person looks at a year and evaluates the last year that has gone by when you ask them, how are you today? And they say, well, <clears throat> in May, I had a bad headache. And let's see, back in February, I had, I actually had a nosebleed. It was dry that day. And you know, the day after New Year's 2016, I got dumped. It's, so today, uh, I'm terrible. <clears throat> Now, is it possible to find people who regulate how they are in their mood or in their feeling, how they perceive right now, on things that don't last that long? Well, <coughs> pretend that instead of one of the, I mean, getting dumped could be bad. It could be a relationship you really care about. But what if it was you lost your legs in February? Or your parents and your siblings were all killed and you were the only one that lived and you were burned really badly. And then they ask you today, so how are you today? I'm terrible. You say, well, let me tell you something. What if a person got sort of got their needle stuck in the phonograph record? Do you remember vinyls? You know, now we use them to go zzzz. Zzz, zzz. You know, in the club, but it used to be that we listened to music at home, but the, that sort of thing. We never went to zip because you wrecked it. And I don't know if it's wrecking it when I do that today, but what used to happen when we would get a scratch on it or some dust or something got in the wrong place in the track or some foil or something, it would, it would do the same, like, three words in the song. And then start over, and then start over, and then start over, and then start over, and it's going, oh, shoot, we'd say the needle got stuck. Sometimes people, they, they get the needle stuck. Uh, I know people who had something bad happen to them, uh, and, and I'm not saying that it doesn't justify their reaction, it, I'm just pointing out, matter of fact, what did happen. They got the needle stuck. They, uh, they got married and then their spouse ran off and left them 37 years ago. And if you ask them, how are you? Well, you know, they still haven't come back to me and uh, I haven't heard a word and uh, I'm lonely and I can just, you know, holidays are coming and, and you go, at some point, look, okay, I appreciate that this is a terrible thing, but you're putting your life in a toilet for the rest of your life over the city. Can, can you at some point turn the page and, and redefine, do something? So you can have this business where you allow these huge long periods for the bad stuff, which is what is focused on, not the good things, to just spoil them all. So let's say that somebody has it down instead to a, a month, okay? So this is one month um, that goes by to this point. This is now, I'll put it here, one month. And this is a month ago. So you ask somebody, hey, how are you doing? But right here, before the month, their house burned to the ground. They lost everything and their dog. 
Okay? I have people in mind that I know, and that I'm, I've been talking to uh, several times a week since they lost their house and it burns clear to the ground in Lake County this summer. And I, and I talk to them on Facebook. And you know what? I'm seeing no mention of the fact that their house come down. They're now located somewhere that isn't as good by comparison. They weren't fully insured. They've redefined, they're carrying on, and they seem just as happy as they did in the spring before the house burned down. So if I say, how's it going? The person is, is saying, that's going really well. You're not referencing this really at all. Okay? So what happens instead if this is only a week? Okay? If, if just before Thanksgiving, somebody had a wrap, and their back and their neck are still stiff, and their car is still gone, and it wasn't insured. And it was their own fault, or there was someone else involved, and then and the other person got hurt, and they, you know, they had an they had an insurance, you know, whatever. So that was more than a week ago. So you say, how you doing? And the person goes, Great. And you go, well, how can they say that? <laughs> There are people who that's exactly the reaction that you will get if it was a week ago. Okay, what if what if it's only a day during which a person references how they're doing? You should keep that. Might need it. What if it's one day? What if you know that yesterday was terrible? You know that the person had a terrible day. You saw them fall down and injure themselves, and their backpack with everything in it they need for this quarter, their notes that they need for all the files coming up, handwritten notes for all the papers that they need to write, but they haven't started yet, just the, the notes. And that was stolen, and you know it. And you ask them today, how are you doing? They're going, oh, fine. And they seem genuinely <coughs> peaceful and happy. And it was just yesterday. They didn't even sort it all that out yet. You go, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty good. But well, what if instead, it was an hour? So uh, at 7 o'clock this morning, uh, someone got a call that uh, something horrible happened. And you saw them taking the call. You know, and had tears in their eyes. And what's the matter? And they tell you about it. You go, oh, I'm so sorry. You go, yeah, this hurts my heart. You know, my feelings are just devastated by this. And then right now you see them. And <clears throat> how you doing? I'm great. No, seriously, how are you doing? No, seriously, I'm great. Well, what about yada yada? Yeah, that happened. Well, how are you now? What? Well, how can you be? Just now. You see where this is going? Does anyone see this trembling? What if it's minutes by minute? Somebody says something that just really is such an insult, and it's somebody you really care what they think. You're in a conversation with them, and they say something, and it's like, well, of course you wouldn't understand. You go, on. that was sure nice. You know, it makes your heart have that, have your stomach have that kind of food feeling in it. Go, oh, why did I put down? I'm not, I'm not doing you like that. Why are you doing me like that? Why would you do that to me? And then, you know, two minutes go by, and, they, and they're back up, and everything is on track, and they've got their arm around the person, and no harm, no foul. Oh, now that would actually be a little bit unusual. It's not impossible to find people like that, but now we're getting to where it's getting a little rare. It's like, when you do me like that, I, I need a few hours to uh, try to reframe that for the cortisol uh, to, to 
become metabolized and, and sorted out and levels to go down and for my blood pressure to go down. I need, my, I need some time for my parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system to uh, chill me out. Um, too much adrenaline. I need some serotonin to, uh, to, to come to the rescue. But what if it was... Second by second, you're just taking it one second at a time. So if something happened, you notice it, and a second goes by, that's fast, and you're all good. You're automatically always pressing the reset, no matter what has happened. Each second, you're pressing the reset. Well, first of all, what that requires is, you're, you're living in, you're dwelling in, you're occupying in your awareness. You're sampling and completely reassessing based only on what has happened in the last second. Now, there could be some things that persist if, if you're getting a beating and it lasts more than a second. One second, you feel terrible. And the next second goes by and you check and you say, I'm still getting beat. I feel terrible. And the next second, a minute goes by and now they're kicking you good and you're saying, okay, it's still bad. But as soon as it stops, then you've got some really residual pain. It still hurts. I still got a broken head. You know, I still got, I still got bruises. I'm still oozing. This is bad. I'm leaking. So one second would make it so that the stuff that doesn't uh, continue to hurt can stop hurting. But even emotional things, if you live in a second, your, your, um, your neurology and your endocrinology, the, uh, the processes that are occurring uh, in the network of your, of your nervous system and your hormones that are circulating through your body they actually have lag times in many cases that are longer than a second. So you can have carryover that you can't help. They impose themselves on you. But what would happen if anybody got it down? Of that, what would that look like? You see, when time goes by, it means that your awareness is being mediated by comparison of states. And we just were shrinking, we were shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, getting those two samplings closer together. But what happens if it gets to zero? Well, it means we're not actually making any comparisons at all. We are actually, <coughs> ready for this? We're not actually able to evaluate at all. It means that we're living without making any evaluations, any comparisons between moment and moment. There's no sampling rate because it's zero. There's no way to compare when there's not two points. There's only the point you're currently in at every instant. And points have no link. Points are instantaneous. This would be somebody who escaped time. This would be somebody who in, a, in every moment, it's pretty much the same thing as dwelling in eternity. When we get to this point, how could we get to this point? Well, in point of fact, in our number of dimensions, it's being, it's like being on the, like the stick guy on the chalkboard. We're out here, and, the, and if I draw a guy on the chalkboard, the guy on the chalkboard cannot perceive 
bust out here. Because the guy in the chalkboard doesn't have this. The guy in the chalkboard has these directions, up and down, left and right only. So what are we? <laughs> so to us, we're like the chalkboard to another whole realm. That is the realm that we're interfacing with or trying to conceive of somehow, which is beyond our capacity in our spirituality. People don't know what to call it. Sometimes they're looking for something like magic. They hope to have some Harry Potter action going. Some people are looking at it as um, uh, escape. Some people are looking at it as a sort of, uh, not escape, but a place to kind of go and draw from and come back. People are looking at it as a destination. Some people look at it as nonsense. It's just this fallacy. If I can't see it or measure it, then it can't be real. Well, we know that that realm is there. We don't just know it from religion. We know it from physics. We know it, in a sense, from math. We can't explain rationally what we observe in our four-dimensional chalkboard without granting that there is a, that there are other dimensions. So you could have the capacity to 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 be at zero and have no time go by, but then to come off of our chalkboard, so to speak, to add one more dimension and have an infinity there without advancing the clock at all. And I'm not saying that this is something that you can just get a special incantation or a formula to, to, to uh, cause this to happen. But I would say this. What if you can approach this? What if you can actually get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, and closer all the time to dwelling in the instant? You, do you realize that if you had your actual consciousness, you were capable, even in brief periods, on purpose, if you were capable of living to where your awareness is only instantaneous, that's too short a period of time for you to feel pain, any pain, because pain requires the comparison from one time to the next time. And there's actually, like just like regular touch or, or visual, or a sound, a stimulus like that, prompt to cause your experience, you know, from your senses, even your internal senses, has to have the stimulus last a certain amount of time. So if it's zero, you would not feel pain. This is how some mystics are able to actually undergo surgeries without anesthesia, because they can choose to not feel the pain. Um, this is kind of a little topic, sorry, but um, have you heard of or seen the movie A Label? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I think that my daughter told me I have to see a Yeah, I think you would have seen it because it kind of like has a different logic. It's different than what we're used to because it kind of like reshapes what time it is. And it's the thing that time is like on a parallel thing. It's all mixed in together, like future, interesting. and past, and it's just, it's really interesting how they... So they're playing together. with escaping our limitations in the space-time continuum? In a sense, like that's not what the point of the story is, but that kind of is what the point of the Well, that might is. help us to understand this kind of thing. It might give us... Um, Something concrete for our imagination, for something right. that is not concrete at all. Right, because like, you know, you watch, like when you watch movies, like just you play out your everyday life, like yeah. you go, like it just happened in the past, it's gonna happen right now, like, in the future, right? Yeah. But in the movie, it's like it's all intertwined, and you don't know what the beginning or the end is. Well, isn't that a little bit reminiscent of texts mm -hmm. that say things like, "Before Abraham was, I am," mm -hmm. and "Hey, a day is like a thousand years to me." Right? I am, when, 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 when uh, God answered Moses' question, asking for his name at the burning bush, um, during the time he was dwelling in the desert, um, 
The answer that we have in English is I am. That the name was just I am. It's not actually the form that's in the Hebrew. Um, it's hard to express because it plays with uh, the tense of that uh, answer, of that word. And it, and it would be a little closer to English to translate it, I am the always having been will be. What's that? It's a, it's a mental gymnastics is what it is. Um, in your steps to Christ, in the chapter that is called The Knowledge of God, um, that's the 10th chapter, page 57, uh, the, the paragraph that starts on the bottom of the page says, if we will but listen, now check that, if we will listen, God's created works will teach us precious lessons of obedience and trust. From the stars that in their trackless collections through space follow from age to age their appointed path, down to the minutest atom. <clears throat> so now, um, this is, to me, when I read this, this is a suggestion that listening, you read this is going to sound ridiculous to you humanities majors, and to you that believe that school is about getting a job after you get out. Uh, this is an admonition to study physics to study astrophysics, and to study particle physics. And if you're not doing it, then you're not reading that book. Remember Ellen White said, nature and revelation alike testify that God is love. Well, it starts the book like that. Yeah. From the stars and in the trackless courses through space follow from age to age their appointed path down to the minutest atoms. The things of nature obey the Creator's will. So it says, if we'll just listen. Man, there's a lot of information available, there's a lot of images available. We've never had better study tools, We've never had better ears with which to listen to nature in recorded history than we have now. And God cares for everything and sustains everyone that he has created. He who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity at the same time cares for the ones of a little brown sparrow that sings its humble song without fear. When men go forth to their daily toil, you know, when, you, when you're down at the flashing red light, people are trying to get to work and they're back at the walls to the hospital, or they're on their way to go do their daily toil. The men go forth to the daily toil, as when they engage in prayer, when they lie down at night, and when they rise in the morning, when the rich man feasts in his palace, or when the poor man gathers his children about the scanty board, that means almost empty table, he is tenderly watched by the head of the Father. No tears are shed that God does not notice. There is no smile that he does not mark. If we would but fully believe this, all undue anxieties would be dismissed. Think of that. Anyone ever anxious? You ever have anxiety? Our lives would not be so filled with disappointment as it is now. But it doesn't mean that things wouldn't happen that are disappointing things. It just says our lives wouldn't be filled with the disappointment. Perhaps shrinking the time that we uh, celebrate disappointment would keep our lives from always being filled with it. 
Our lives would not be so filled with disappointment as now, for everything, whether great or small, would be left in the hands of God. Who is not perplexed by the multiplicity of cares, or overwhelmed by their weight? We should then enjoy a rest of soul to which many have long been strangers. As your senses delight in the attractive loveliness of the earth, and, and is that something that happens to you? Are you the object of that? Are you the victim of that, so to speak? What do we lose? <laughs> is a plastic plant realizing that it's all? <laughs> I'll be darned. I mean, they make these things more real all the time. Think of it. A deciduous plastic plant. <laughs> <laughs> How do they make those? <laughs> I'm surprised. I mean, given what we're reading, <laughs> some of you should have some shivers. It's not life, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's quite good. <laughs> That's even weirder because. Yeah, what were we just saying? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> As your senses delight in the attractive loveliness of the earth, and, the, and does nature have a sense of humor? Can we see God's sense of humor in nature? Or are we so tuned to the godless physicalism insisted upon like it was knowledge and not just an alternate religion, that when something like that happens, our minds immediately dismiss it, even though funny, we say, of course, that would never be something that God would do. Because that's play like we think of in church. Wow, the charm and the magic goes out of life. We're like dead people with no nothing charming at all. When we're that skeptical, we don't have to be nuts either so that every time we take a step, we go, whoa, how did the star line up? So that we took that step. You know, you know, you don't get to be nuts. But I mean, all through in nature, not just the stars and the, and the atoms, but the math of the thing. The math itself, which Einstein and others said, was the language with which God wrote the universe. And I will add, and is still writing it. Is still writing it. The book hasn't come to its conclusion. It, it's just getting started. God is still writing it. And the, the math is the language. So one of the things that I like to do is actually ponder the the probability mathematics of the things that occur. Especially things that go, oh, that was a coincidence. Oh, how did that happen? How was it that someone that I haven't thought about for how long? For a year, for 16 years, or whatever, that I think about them for a few minutes, and then my phone rings and it's them. I haven't talked to them in years. Tell me, never have anything like that happen. Tell me, your life has nothing like that. You go, okay, woo, that was strange. But then you think, huh, coincidence is a funny thing. Why do that? Why have that habit of being so faithless? That it's also stupid to say, I know exactly what that meant. And then to think that we're a diviner with a special gift when we don't have it. Maybe we do, but we probably don't. Just be amazed. Just allow ourselves to be in awe at, at the miracles. Even the regular stuff is miraculous. The probability of just the regular stuff and the silly things that happen, we can go, huh, well, that was... I'm not sure what that means, but it's cool. Like that. It's kind of funny. <clears throat> As your senses delight in the attractive loveliness of the earth, and I'll add to that, and the humor that's in nature. Think of the world that is to come. 
Think of the world that is to come. That shall never know the blight of sin and death. Where the face of nature will no more wear the shadow of the curse. Let your imagination picture the world, excuse me, the home of the saved. And remember that it will be more glorious than your brightest imagination can portray. <clears throat> you know, here, right here, there is an invitation to use. Not just to say, hey, I could if I wanted to. Someday I might. Or, hey, here's something that I could have done but didn't. To use your imagination to ponder those exact things. No. To grapple with them. To build the, the best images. To invite God to participate in your imagination as you do what is said here. To picture the home of the saved. And to remember that it can be more glorious than our imagination could ever portray. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I have not seen nor ear heard. You ever seen, you ever, you ever heard that passage? I have not seen nor ear heard. Contribute to man's imagination. Very good. Can you say it again? Say it again loud. Everybody listen. Um, I have not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into man's imagination what God hath planned for those who love him. Ouch, man. In the very gifts of God in nature, we see but the faintest gleaming of his glory. It is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. First Corinthians. Two verse nine. Listen to this. All of you who have heard that, except unless we become as little children, we're not going to be in God's kingdom. <laughs> Parents should seek to comprehend the fact that they are to train their children for the courts of God. When they are entrusted with children, it is the same as though Christ placed them in their arms and said, train these children for me, that they may shine in the courts of God. One of the first sounds that should attract their attention is the name of Jesus. And in the earliest years, they should be led to the footstool of prayer. Here's the point that I want to make um, the last sentence of that paragraph. Their minds should be filled with stories of the life of the Lord and their imaginations and their imaginations encouraged in picturing the glories of the world to come. Their imaginations encouraged in picturing the glories of the world to come to come. Why teach that to children? Because it should be their lifelong habit. Our imaginations, to fill our imaginations with, the, with what it's going to be like in a world that has no sin, in a world without any selfishness, in a world in which people's love for each other rivals their love for their self, themselves. Imagine doing this. When you say, okay, I pray. It took me 30 seconds, or it took me a minute and a half, or I worked through the list in that little three by five card in my Bible of people I'm praying for, and I have my prayer list, and I did it. It's, it's fine to have the kind of prayer. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with the kind of prayer life 
in which we go and sit on Santa Claus's lap, and so to speak, and ask for the things we want that are on our list. That's fine. But if that's all there is, how much relationship do you have with the Santa Claus at the mall? Right? You get your picture taken. And you say, uh, what I want for Christmas is, uh, I want a Ferrari. Uh, and some of the ones. And uh, some, some of those pink Ray-Bans. Oh, oh, I, I want that. And I want the new iPhone. And I want a new, um, I want a new color laser printer, and I want the, uh, a new, the newest Apple TV, minus the hang. You give the list. That's okay. But imagine this. And by the way, I've done this. Literally, I did this for five years. Uh, each summer at camp meeting in the Arizona conference, I was in charge of the junior division, the fifth and sixth graders, 10, 11 year olds. <clears throat> we scheduled an all night prayer for 10 and 11 year olds. 10 and 11 year olds came together and they didn't sleep that night. They spent the whole night praying. They were 10 and 11. And they were in ecstasy. They, they begged to do it again before the camp meeting ended. We didn't do it twice. We only did it for one time each year. But one of the things we did was take, with 10 and 11 year olds, you think about their attention span, all right? We took two hours of that time to imagine. To close your eyes and actively imagine uh, elaborately that we were in the new earth. Everything had been created perfectly, and they were to navigate in the streets of the, of the new earth to their home, the one they would live in. So we took time to construct it, to design it, and then change a few things and back away and look at it. We came inside and we furnished it. We decorated it inside. We went back outside and addressed the landscaping some more. We filled the cupboards. We filled the refrigerator. And then we sat down on the couch and said, I think I got it. Looking around and then there was a knock on the door. Who is it? Perfect. I love it. <laughs> See what I mean? Sorry. <laughs> Go to life blowing off awesome stuff or, or celebrating it like, oh, well, that was cool. Hmm? We're not there yet. <laughs> and when they opened the door, it was Jesus. And then we said, we'll invite him in. Where will you see him? Ask him if he's hungry. He is hungry. We spent that time then with them, having set that up, then having this conversation with Jesus himself for two hours. Oh, I dare you to play in your imagination like that. The paper is due a week from today before class starts when you walk in the door. It should be submitted online. There will be a place online to put it on the course website. Do not print it out and do not put it in the tree form. I think she deserves a lot of dollars. No, it was out of time.
It was out of the uh, I have no idea. I don't know what you want to do. If you wanted to talk to me, I don't know what you want to talk to me until we start talking. Oh, wow. I don't know. I intend not to mention him or to try to there is no